Tani has won over $30 billion for issues ranging from schools to gang violence prevention to revolutionizing the use of data and policy making. Prior to co-founding Advancement Project, Connie was co-director of the Los Angeles Office of the NAHCP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Was an associate in the national firm, law firm Morrison and Forrester, and a clerk to the Honorable Damon J. Keith, judge of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, or the Sixth Circuit, I got it wrong there. Connie is a graduate of Harvard University and the New York University School of Law. I've known her in many different disguises through the years. As mayor, she and I agreed about half the time and then disagreed the other half, but we somehow or other kept talking to each other. Her firm, she stole one of my mentees, uh, Kim Patia, as one of the lawyers in her firm, and she has become a, an author of a highly acclaimed book called Power Concedes Nothing. But it's my privilege to introduce to you one of the great leaders, one of the most caring people I've ever met, Connie Rice. Did I do okay? <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Can you hear me? Do you want some? There we go. Hi, everybody. The mayor. Oh, I adore the mayor. We used to fight like cats and dogs, but every time he saw me, he would have to say, Connie, are you with me or are you not? But the thing that I want to thank Mayor Reardon for. And you can tell by the fact that he would spend an evening with young people. His passion has always been children. And um, I will never, ever forget the day that he realized that in Watts, I took him down to uh, Jordan Downs Housing Project, and he'd never been there before. And, and he said, I want all the kids to come with me on my bike ride on the weekends. I mean, we used to ride the bikes. I don't know, maybe, maybe you still, still do. And I looked at him and, he, and I said, Mayor, these children don't have bicycles. They can't afford them. And his face, I thought he was going to cry. And he ordered 200 bicycles delivered that afternoon. And he took all the kids. You see, Mayor Reardon gave an incredible lesson. He taught the incredibly wealthy cadre of our LA community, the wealthy elite, why they should care about the rest of us. And he demonstrated it every day with his foundation, and he demonstrated it as mayor, even though I found out I liked him the first time I sued him. <laughs> But thank you, Mayor Reardon. Please give him another round of applause, our mayor. This program is just amazing. I, it's almost enough to make me speechless, but unfortunately for you, not quite. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I've been watching too much of The Voice. I could just imagine the chairs turning around, you know, hitting the buzzer. But they were all so fantastic. Mayor, Mayor, I hope you're still here because I want you to raise the money. I don't want any of them not to have any money, so I want all of them to win, okay? <laughs> He's giving me that I'm gonna kill you look. Um, no, but I'm, I'm dead serious. It, it, it also gave me flashbacks to when I was a Harvard admissions officer and had to fight to get uh, people into Harvard. Uh, but um, I'd have fought for all of you, and you'd have all been in the class uh, had I had my choice. You are just fantastic, and thank you so much. Everybody in this room, everybody in this room, you wouldn't be here at an event like this if you didn't have a passion for making society just, for creating opportunity, and for making sure everybody's at our kitchen table eating. You just, you, this is not a normal evening. You, you all are not normal. Just understand that, okay? 
thank goodness you're not normal. I, I almost do the opposite of what you do. Uh, no, I don't make things worse, but <laughs> what I thought about was how powerful how powerful your end of the spectrum is. And I'm looking over here because I saw a number of you sitting down. You know, I'm, I'm blinded by this ridiculous light. But the single human being, the single life, the single person whom you can take from despair to success and thriving, uh, be it a foster child, be it a former gangster, although I, the guy who, the first presenter is probably dealing with current gangsters the way I do, to elderly, to the sight challenge, blind, um, abilities community. I call it the abilities community because uh, if you call them disabled, what we don't understand is that they're functioning in our world without our advantages and so they actually have more ability than, than we do. But I, I just wanted to, the one on one, it just reminded me of this spectrum. The helping one child at a time, one elder person at a time, one girl going, oh, rowing, oh my gosh, we had to get up at five every morning and go down and run the stadium stairs. I just had flashbacks. Uh, it, was, it was like my whole life was being presented uh, through, these, through these different um, action groups. You inspire, you empower, you transform, and you have impact, incredible impact. And um, I, I, I mean it, Mayor, you're going to have to raise the money for all of them. Um, that end of the spectrum is so critical. One child at a time, one human being at a time. Investing in them. Getting them ready for all of life's opportunities. Or keeping a disaster from wiping their lives out. I'm not socially skilled enough to do that kind of work. I'm not one-on-one. -on -one. The reason I'm a class action impact lawyer is that because class action lawyers don't have to talk to their clients. <laughs> Sheriff Baca once said that Connie's so socially unskilled that she sues you to tell you that she wants a relationship. <laughs> He wasn't joking. <laughs> That's rule number one. Know what you're good at, know what you're passionate about, and go for it. Throw fear to the wind and go for it. And we've just been presented with 10 incredibly uh, examples of that philosophy in life. If you're on the other end of the spectrum, without the social skills, without the patience, you do systems change. You don't deal with individual people. You deal with systems. I do systems. And the impact that you have on systems, but you follow a very similar thinking trajectory, planning trajectory, action planning trajectory. Um, our lawsuits, and we look for problems that are stuck on stupid, can't get solved by the politicians because they owe somebody money or they want to run for another office. There's always some reason the politicians can't solve a problem. I don't blame them. I work with them. I actually befriend them and, and let them know that I'm suing them as a friend. <laughs> and, and that I'm there to help them and that they should use my lawsuit as a reason to get the courage to do what they need to do. Um, that. <laughs> When it comes to being mean and forcing people to do things they don't want to do, I'm very socially skilled, but that's another end of the, of the social skills. But the other end of the spectrum, I live with cats, did not have children, and did not marry. So don't. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You know, I am not. So, and, I, and I partnered up with Molly Munger because she is enormously socially skilled. Um, she actually goes through my trash and, 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 and picks up the invitations that I've thrown away and, and says, Connie, we don't tell Leon Panetta no. 
and hands me this. She does trash guarding for me. So when you deal with systems, and as I was sitting there and listening to you, the presenters, you made me remember that we are simply two ends of a bar of hope. Without what you do, what I do means nothing. We can reform LAPD and it took 20 years of my time and 50 years of everybody else's time. That systems change is so well on its way, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have to pinch myself. We now have Chief Beck, it started with Chief Bratton. Uh, read my book, you'll see the story of how we got Chief Bratton and how that journey through LAPD to change the hearts and minds of our cops so we would never have another Rodney King beating. The story is in there. But it began with systems analysis. Why do these cops behave this way? Why does this, the structure of this police department reinforce the brutality? Oh, and then more importantly, what do we have to do to unwind it? What do we have to do? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it took lots of years of litigation, about 50 years of litigation. I came in on the last 15 years of that. Ramona Ripston and I got to know each other quite well. You know, it took me about five years before I, didn't, I realized Ramona wasn't a lawyer. She's as good as any lawyer I've ever seen. But Ramona, the ACLU, MALDEF, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, we're the enforcement arm. We were the only check on LAPD. That story, we started out, it was so bad that the, the Police Protective League would actually throw me out of two buildings bodily. It was, it got physical. We were at war. We were determined to sue, to force LAPD to police constitutionally in compliance with the United States Constitution. We went from physical warfare and confrontation to today, I have a parking space next to the chief's car, and I have a batch. Now, the mayor and I always fought over the police. We were not together at that point. But today, the mayor and I would be very happy to walk into the new headquarters, and uh, both of us would be welcome, and that's a big change. Um, it took nine years of day-to-day -day work. It got to the point where they stopped calling security to have my blue Prius removed from the parking lot because you see, you, you know, a Prius is a liberal car and you don't have a Prius sitting around uh, in a sea of Crown Victoria, uh, Crown, Crown Vicks as they call them. And Chief Paysinger used to call for security in the towing, the towing truck, they have their own towing trucks. It took all of us changing Systems change went right back to the winning the hearts and minds of the individuals. I had to learn to dance with the police, not just spar. I had to stop the sparring and the fighting. I had to swallow my pride. And I had to learn to dance. It wasn't easy. My first meeting when Bratton pulled me in and he said, I need you to do the last Rampart investigation, you remember the gangster cop scandal? And he said, I need, well, I used that report. I used that report that he asked me to do. He said, tell me what we missed. I said, you missed the whole cover up. And he said, oh my God, I knew I couldn't ask her to do anything, but he gave it to me. He gave it to me and he accepted my analysis, but here's where I got smart. He was smart to bring me in. I was smart to recognize the enormous political risk that he was taking by bringing me inside and that I had to change how I operated, how I thought about them, and how I interacted with them. I had to inspire them. I had to create trust in me. They had to trust that I was there to help them, not sue them. They had to trust that I was trying to forge a way for them, not just out of the consent decree, but into community trust. We wanted community trust policing. We wanted cops whom we didn't fear. What a long journey, we're still on it. We're still on it. Jerry Chaleff, Chief Bratton, the most amazing police commissions that we've ever seen. 
Nine years we toiled. It wasn't just about issuing a consent decree. The consent decree was the floor and just the beginning and it was just a piece of paper. How do you take a federal consent decree and inspire a movement within the hearts and minds of police to see the community as human beings they are there to protect, not target. I had one, this is where I will end this anecdote and then I will move on to one last anecdote. I had one, he's now a deputy chief, he just got promoted, but Commander Green, oh, you talk, we could have made a movie about us. It was like, Tina Turner met Vic Mackey. I mean, we were like oil and water. Oh, man, did we like to fight. And I have to tell you, there's something wrong with me. I, I, I do like to fight. Even when in my pastime, what do I do in my pastime? Taekwondo. I mean, I fight even when for my relaxation. And there's something wrong with me. That's why I became a litigator. Not very many women became litigators 25 years ago, but I always knew I was going to be a litigator because I love to fight. I mean, law school was a way for me to do damage to people without going to prison. <laughs> So, you know, for the young women in there, do not follow in my footsteps. I am totally abnormal. But when I looked at Commander Green, Commander Green is now a deputy chief. He went to Washington, D.C. with me three months ago. And he called me and said, Connie, how, 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 do, I, how do I do uh, testimony on the Hill? I said, well, you know, they're going to be moving their furniture. It's a presidential election year. There will be nobody at the committee, but let's just make the record. And then we'll come back and we'll tell them what legislation they have to change. But you see, the Republicans called Commander Green. They just knew LAPD was going to do shock and awe testimony and, and demand more money for guns. Commander Green opened up. And in fact, when he entered the room with me, the Republican lawyers came racing across the Judiciary Committee room to grab him away from me to say, you can't come in with her. That's the Democratic door. I was the one single witness for the Dems, because they're now in the minority. He was a Republican witness, and he started out, I think he said my name four times in the first four sentences. He said, I'm here with Connie Rice. Connie Rice taught me how to love a community that I have feared and hated. I now serve poor people, and I'm proud to do it, and I'm not leaving South Bureau, and I'm going to retire there, and I'm going to make sure that every child in Watts has a chance to thrive. LAPD, okay? It took an army of us, but it took just a few of us who think in systems. And then the individual transformations, the hearts and minds that had to change. But my heart and my mind had to change just as much as theirs did. I couldn't do what I was good at. I had to do the one thing I was bad at. And with the Police Protective League, we need to make a movie about those interactions. We really do. And I'm, I'll never forget the first dinner. They actually cooked a dinner for me and I watched everything they put in the pan. <laughs> I was in the kitchen and, 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 and Cliff Ruff was making my drink and I had to watch that too because I said, you know what, they could, I, I, I trusted them as far as I could throw the Pentagon building and I stood there pretending and I, I did, I do have enough skill to, to, to be calm enough so that I'm not, you know, uh, uh, so that I, I, you know, it was okay for me to be in the kitchen and, and they were like, well, Connie, you know, you've changed, you know, we can now work with you because you've changed and I'm thinking, I haven't changed a bit, what is he talking I said, keep your mouth shut, don't say, I had taught my, I told my staff, count back from 10. Do not respond to them. They're going to say all kinds of stupid stuff that's going to make you want to slap them. Do not slap them. They will shoot you. I said, I said, I said, we're not there yet. I said, we well, never hit a cop. Don't touch a cop. But I, 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 I said, just count back from 10. So Cliff is making my drink and he hands me his drink. I think the drink's okay. And I take a small sip and he says, now Connie, you're going to have to learn. You're going to have to listen. We need you to listen. We need you to just hear us out because we need you to understand. We're going to be working together. We need you to understand something. And this is what we need you to understand. We need you to understand why the Rodney King beating was a good beating. Ten, nine, <laughs> eight, seven. <laughs> By the end of that evening, I had a hole in my cheek, okay? But I did not say. I did not lash out. I stayed calm. And I listened. And I said, that's water under the bridge. I'm not fighting them about that anymore. 
I'm now inside the castle and you want to know something? I'm going to bring down this blue wall and we're going to have community policing. It was an army of us, an army of lawyers, an army of community groups. This city transformed its police and with Chief Beck, we've got the best chief I've ever seen. With Chief Charlie Beck, I'll never forget it. I looked at him, because he used to be a crash officer, and I said, Charlie, what made you change? He finally convinced me. I was, I had my arms crossed. I said, oh, great, old wine and old bottles. We're not seeing any change here. When I first saw him at Rampart Division, and I asked him, what made you change? And he looked at me, and he said, Connie, search and destroy was no longer working. I need to love and protect the people I serve, not destroy them. Systems change is directly linked to the one-on-one -on -one hearts and minds change. But it takes a different kind of energy and it's a different kind of weightlifting. You really do have to understand how a system works. Then you have to understand why it doesn't work properly. Once you've got that assessment, you can get a game plan. But the structural changes are the easiest. It is the human capital changes that are the hardest. But no lasting, sustained, systemic change is possible without the two together. Um, in 30 years of doing systems change work amongst the lawyers, and advocates and statisticians and law professors and gang anthropologists. I mean, I'm, one thing I am good at is finding experts to work for nothing. Um, out of our lawsuits and out of the legislation that we've passed, out of the bonds that we put on the ballot, we have made change that is valued at over $35 billion with a B. That's transformational change at a systems level. It is not any more important than transforming a single life, freeing someone to thrive in the mainstream, helping an elderly person stay in their home, See, watching a, a young girl row her way into her own future. Every last one of you does it at the individual level. But for the lasting impact, I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with the asocial people like me. But together, together, that's where the magic happens. When you get the systems impact people with the human transformers like you, we've got something. We've got something big. And for the philanthropists out there, listen, you all got to get a clue, okay? Because you have to start putting us together. You have to start funding things on a longer basis. You can't do change at $10,000 a pop. We need, the conservatives don't do it that way. The conservatives give a million dollars to the Christian coalition and then watch them transform the politics of this country. We need to think systemically. We need to put the coalitions together. You need to put just a couple of people who can keep them knit together because you don't want this dark. The Darwinian funding destroys the coalitions. It destroys the cohesiveness. We need to be like a spear, all one to make it stick. But if the funders keep pitting us against one another, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm sorry, I have to. It, the funders have got to understand the nature of the work. They do, they do. They understand the projects. I'm not suggesting that the program, pro, the program officers are all my friends. Um, I haven't grown up yet. I'm still an activist and still in the courts and still terrorizing people. And, most of my friends are judges by now. I'm going on 60. It's just pitiful. I won't grow up. I'm not growing up. I've got a Peter Pan problem, although I don't look at it. Bottom line, bottom line, we got to get philanthropy to fund systems change that matches with this and that we put, it took us nine years to transform LAPD. 
And I'll tell you, I, I, they don't allow me to raise the money, as you can see why. <laughs> Every funder I've ever met, I've ended up insulting. They do not, my firm and my organization do not allow me to raise money. But I, my, my plea, my plea is for the funders to wade into the muck of systems work and not be afraid by the scale, the politics, or the intensity of the work that's needed. Most, funders, most of the groups I know, most of my allies stay away from the politics. I attached myself to Dick Reardon. He couldn't get rid of me. He decided he had to like me. Okay? Because I wasn't going anywhere. He's the mayor of this city and my job is to make him successful. He doesn't understand that I'm there to help him, but once he did, he too married me. Okay? Bottom line, we can't be afraid of the politics. It can be messy, but there are a few of us who are kind of, I'm just asocial, not antisocial, but asocial enough to deal with politicians. I'm actually quite good with them because they're afraid of me. If you get a couple of people like Ramona Ripst and Connie Rice, just a couple of us, as the tip of the spear, we can deal with the politics. Please don't be afraid of the politics. If you're not dealing with the politics, the politics are doing you. We've got to get in there and force these government systems, these public sector systems, take the best out of the public sector, match it with the private sector. Whoever's giving me a time card needs to come up here because I can't see you, okay? Okay, time card. <laughs> Where are you? Time? Okay. One more minute, one more minute, and then we'll take some questions. When we, when we, I know you said time, but just one more. <laughs> Come on, Mayor. The mayor, is the mayor going to yank me? I've got to tell the story of, of, of us building the schools together. Okay, Real quick. I came out here, I came out here with one remark I want to say. What? You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Mayor. I love you, too. <laughs> go, go ahead. Tell, tell the story. Yes. The mayor cared about education like nobody else. Okay, he and Mayor Villaraigosa are very much education mayors. He cares about kids. If we don't make these schools work, we're doomed. That's the next thing I'm going into is the schools, and then I'm starting a slavery project because as the great-granddaughter of slaves, I can't abide this human trafficking. We just got to stop it. I'm not having slavery in the 21st century, okay? <laughs> but when we had to build the schools, we took over the school board. He made it possible for us to take over the school board. Now, I'm not going to suggest that, we do to that you do electoral politics. We had to because that's what the situation called for. There was no possibility of systems change unless we took over the Board of Education. That was the analysis, remember? Right. And Janethia told him, we're taking over the board, and, and, and the mayor said, how much do you need? <laughs> Bottom line, we took over the school board. We went, listen to this, talk about the different sectors being sewn together to do systems impact. We went to Fort Hoanimi after we won the school board. This is just a school board election, no small thing. We had to beat the Democratic machine, and we did. Number two, they're still not speaking to us. Number two, we put Janethia Hayes in there. Brilliant woman. She's who I'll be when I grow up. You think I'm fearful? Oh, man, fearsome. Oh, man, that woman will scare Rumsfeld. Number three, number three, we hired Roy Romer. Roy Romer didn't need the job. He was only there to help the kids. And the mayor was behind us the whole way. Now, number four, you want to know what we did to get the schools built? We built 135 schools on time, on budget, because we went to Fort Wainimi and recruited nine retiring Navy Seabees. The military built our schools. Okay, lesson, lesson. You take all the best from each of these sectors, the civic sector, the 501c3 sector, the military. I'm a military kid. That's why we went to the military. We had the, 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 the engineering corps do the wiring of the schools, and we have the Navy Seabees build our schools. Best of the military sector, the best of the private sector. We Finally, we got it to the point where, where it, was, it was so well run. The construction authority was so well run under the Seabees, and we had to wall off the politicians. We didn't let the politicians touch the money. That was the secret number five. And, and it got to the point where 
Tudor Saliba and Parsons and all the big boys came back into school construction. We have 135 brand new schools. They are beautiful. They were designed by the best architects. Frank Geary did one. And I'm telling you, these children looked at us 10 years later. This little boy at Miguel Contreras School, he looked at us and he said, you really care about me, don't you? We can do this stuff, individual impact together. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.